Hi everybody, and thanks for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial of Charlie Craven's 2-Bit Hooker. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of push aside the name of this fly because it's quite interesting, but I'd like to focus on some of the characteristics of Charlie's fly. For starters, when this fly first came out, I really thought it was going to take over the fly fishing game because of one primary reason, the weight. If you have a fly that has lots of weight, it's going to get to the bottom quickly and it's probably going to catch a lot of fish because that's where the majority of them tend to spend a lot of their time. Now, I've noticed that this pattern has not kind of found its way into everyone's boxes. I'm not quite sure why, but it has found a way into mine, and I'll tell you some reasons why here as I go on to tell you a little bit more about the pattern. Well, as I was mentioning, there's a lot of weight to it. Charlie decided not to add one tungsten bead, but instead add two. He's basically doubled the weight immediately, placed it near the front of the fly, and just ensured that that fly is going to get to the bottom really quickly. What's nice about that as well, he's built up the thorax a little bit. And it seems like in a lot of mayfly nymphs, they have really heavy thoraxes, yet as tires, sometimes we're afraid to add that extra bulk. By placing that second bead, you're immediately going to have it there. The other nice thing that Charlie did was he really kept a very slender profile for that body. You don't have a lot of materials, all you really need is some ribbing and your thread, and you have that body and it's just really easy to build up in a short amount of time. Now there's some other really neat things about this fly that as tires we can adjust a little bit. For starters is the tail. In this video today, instead of just using some regular hen fibers, I'm going to be using some Coke de Leon. It's a little bit more resistant and I know that if this fly is going to be on the bottom a lot, it's probably going to get torn up and I can use that CDL instead. Also, Charlie decided to use some super fine or just some basically beaver dubbing or some type of wet fly dubbing around that thorax. What's nice is that you can really just vary that color. If you want to use black to go after those stone flies, if you want to go after the blueing olives, you can add some olive. But if you really want to just kind of go out there, you're more than welcome to just change that color up and almost make it similar to a hot spot. The other great thing about this fly is that similar to the Copper John, which also that's a fly that tends to live on the bottom, Charlie decided to place a little bit of holographic tinsel on top of the thorax and coat it with some epoxy, which I'm going to use some UV glue during this tutorial instead. So you got a lot of really great things going on. There's a lot of instances when tying this fly that you can vary it, either to meet your needs or to kind of make it stand out and make it look different from some of those other patterns that are out there. So please don't be afraid to just vary it. It might be something as simple as just adding a different colored bead. So you have one that might be black closer to the head and then you could have one that's olive to kind of look like that bluing olive that you might be tying. With that said, I also really want to just point out that there's a couple different ways to fish this pattern. I would fish this pattern primarily as a nymph on the bottom. Occasionally I would hang a fly off of the bend of this hook, but this fly is going to be one that will live on the bottom. If you like to fish a hopper dropper, that type of a combo, so you have a dry fly and then a piece of monofilament coming off its tail, this could be that fly that you could add to that monofilament, but make sure that that dry fly that you're fishing is one that's going to float really well because this two-bit hooker, it can definitely sink and it will drag your average dry fly under the surface. So keep that in mind. But this is a fly that you want to fish down. I would not recommend fishing it as a, an emerger because there's just way too much weight and it's really not going to represent that mayfly as it rises towards the surface. So I've told you a little bit about this fly. Uh, thanks go out to Charlie Craven because he created a great one. And if this fly doesn't have a spot in your box, make sure you get it there. So now I'm going to show you a picture of the finished fly. I'm going to list all the materials and then I'm going to go over the procedures to tie Charlie Craven's 2-bit hooker. All right, let's start tying this 2-bit hooker nymph. In my Stonfo vise right now, I have some hooks from Allen Fly Fishing. This is their W501BL. These are nymph and wet fly hooks, and this is a size 14, though I will tie this anywhere between a size 12 and a 20. Well, um, the reason I'm going to recommend the 501BL, first of all, it's barbless, so it's easy to get both of these tungsten 2.4 millimeter beads around that bend of the hook without having to mess around with anything. But second of all, uh, this Allen Fly Fishing hook is one extra length long. So what that basically means is if you look at the, the eye of the hook, you add one additional one of those to the standard and that's about one additional length long. That's really nice for this pattern because we have really so much going on and it kind of allows us some wiggle room throughout it. Well for starters, to this hook I'm going to add a little bit of unithread. This is their ADOT olive 
Really perfect color. We're going to be tying a blueing olive nymph today. And this is actually going to be the body of the fly. So this is a great one to start with. I'm going to bring that down to about the halfway point. Once there, I'm just going to grab some Coke de Leon fibers. Pull out a healthy pinch of those. I'm going to line those up with the hook, and I basically want them approximately one half to three quarters the length of the hook shank. So once I have those going out, I'm just going to lock those in place, wrap back a little bit, double check the length. In fact, in this case, though I would typically tie a pheasant tail that length, I don't want these that long for this hook. So just going to just recheck them, make them a little shorter. That's where I want them now. Next, I'm going to grab some, again, some unithread. This time, I'm going to grab some a dot. See if I can find the, the end of this. What we're going to be doing with the a dot, I'm just going to just cut a piece of a dot black unithread. Probably tough for you even to see this. It's going to be about four inches long. This is going to be used, used as our ribbing for this fly. Very simple ribbing. Just going to lock that in. And actually, once I lock this in, I'm going to wind forward, just helping to create a little bit of a, a taper towards the thorax of this fly. I might cut the tag end of that, that thread and of those Coke de Leon fibers, lock those in, and now I'm going to wrap back, slowly creating the body for this fly. Once I get to about the point where the, the, uh, the barb of the hook would be, I'm going to stop and wind back forward. And there's going to be a little taper naturally built in since I've already been to that halfway point and back towards the thorax. Now if you want to just, just thicken that up just a little bit, wrap back to about that point and back forward to the beads. All right, once my thread is just hanging there, I'm going to go back to this black ribbing. What I'm going to do with this ribbing, once it's in my hands, or my fingers, I'm just going to twist it in one direction. That's going to allow it, that's going to basically force it to not sit typically uh, flat. Because when we put thread just on top of thread, especially this black A dot, it's going to almost sit flat. I don't mind if it goes a little flat, but for the most part, I really like that narrow look. I want that green to be the focal point of our body. And that black, I just want that, that ribbing to contrast just lightly against the body. All right, at this point, I'm going to, again, wrap back to about the halfway point, around right here. I want to make sure those beads are still movable, which they are. And I'm going to add in a little wing case. In this, in this instance, it's going to be some holographic tinsel. The size is medium. The color is silver. You, if you prefer that clear or more of that, that opal color, um, you're more than welcome to go for that. This is also really just a great color to add in there, though I tend to be partial towards this silver because I, I feel like it gives just a lot of just flash in the water. As I lock it in place, I want to make sure it's going straight back because I'm going to be bringing this wing case over once I have all of my ribbing and my legs in there. So I want to make sure when I bring that over, it does go perfectly over. Next, I'm going to add some dubbing. This is some SLF Squirrel Spiky Dubbing. The color is brown olive. Looks just great for a thorax. By selecting that brown in there with that olive, and dubbing those two together, SLF has just created a really nice dark thorax for us here. I want a tight dubbing in this case. Since this is a mayfly nymph, you don't have to worry about making it super buggy. This is one of those flies where it's almost less is more. And in fact, I don't want to even wrap it too far forward. If you want to create a little taper for it, you definitely can. When I get close to that first bead, I'm actually going to just kind of hold the thread and jump between those two beads. I'm going to place a few wraps of dubbing between those beads as well. I almost want it just even, nearly even, between the, those two beads. So I don't want to get too much in there. But if I can make it almost even between those, whenever I place my legs on top, they're not going to jut out at a 90 degree angle. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just one second. All right, that's more than enough dubbing there between the beads. So next I'm going to grab a nice little olive um, uh, hen, set, hen um, I'm sorry, an olive hen back. This has some really nice modeling in it. 
you can basically just grab any any feather you want. Don't be too um, particular about the size in this case. And the nice thing is you can reuse these feathers time and time again. What I'm going to do first is just take a scissor from the back and trim out the top section. I'm just going to cut real close to the stem. And by doing that, this is what the feather now looks like. I'm going to just hold on to these tips and stroke the feathers down. If you think about an insect, an insect will typically have six legs. You would not know that if you talk to any of us fly tires. In this case, I do not have three on each side. I have just quite a few more than three, but that's okay because this fly tires, we want lots of legs in there. So I put these legs on top and I basically want these legs to be going back, touching that hook point. Now, whenever I get them to that desired distance, I'm actually gonna take my left hand and just touch them here and put a few wraps of thread around them. Now, this is the case though you have to be really careful because A, if you don't have any dubbing between these two beads and you go to wrap those feathers there, they're just gonna get sunk down between them and they're gonna come out at a 90 degree angle on the left and right side of this hook shank. Now, if you have too much thread or too much dubbing between those beads, it's gonna bulk up big time right there. So this is one of those flies that you really have to tie quite a few of them and get comfortable and figure out exactly how much dubbing and how much material you need between those two beads. Well, I have about the right amount, so I'm just gonna line these up, just pinch them a little bit, place one wrap, two wraps, get about four wraps in there. You can see mine are not going at a 90 degree angle, so that's everything's looking fine with those. And I'm actually gonna stop with four wraps. I may trim these real close. And at that point, I can actually add more dubbing if I'd like, though if I add more dubbing, it's really just gonna build up that head a little bit. So I'm just gonna pinch those fibers back a little bit, add one or two thread wraps, bring my holographic tinsel forward, make sure it's lined up straight. This is the point where you don't wanna overdo it with wraps. About three wraps, pinch back. You only need one or two in front of it and then get rid of your tinsel. Now at this point, if you feel comfortable, you can get a half hitch in there. I'll just lock it all in with one half hitch. I just don't want anything to come out. It's kind of tough when you have all these beads in there. At that point, you can just take a quick look at the fly, see if there's anything else you need to do. In this case, it is looking fine for me. Those legs look really smooth. I'm gonna extend my thread. Just add one whip finish. All right, after I have that whip finish, I can trim my thread. We have now a partially completed two-bit hooker. You can see those legs are just going back. They look really nice against uh, the, the body of the fly. They're not going too far. Nice, really thin, slender uh, body profile with those nice Coque de Leon tailing fibers. The only thing we're missing is a little bit of UV clear fly finish. Now, I have the thin on here. In this case, sometimes I do prefer the thick because it's really easy to bulk up the fly finish on this fly. And if you get too much in there, what will happen is that it will just get quickly absorbed into those materials. So you gotta be really careful when you're applying this stuff. In this case today, I'm gonna apply it with my light. My This is my UV light nearly on. I almost want it on as that glue's coming out so it's setting the glue immediately. I don't want it just really sitting on there, all this fly and getting absorbed by those materials. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of an amount of this glue onto my needle and once it's on that needle you can see I just want just a little bit for now oops I dropped some it's the downside of using is clear once it's on my needle I'm just gonna hit it with this light from a distance just a little bit back and I bring my light forward just lock just a little bit in there you can see it's actually it's drying on my needle I'm gonna add a little bit more now. I'm gonna do that one more time. So I'm just adding a little bit to my needle. I'm just gonna hit it with the light from a far distance away. Start moving this in closer. And now once I have just a little bit there, I'm gonna train my light on it. Just let it begin to set up. I keep my light on it for a good 15 seconds, 
just to make sure everything's in there. If I, if you want on a little bit more going back towards the body, you're more than welcome to add that. I just want enough just to give it that nice little shimmer, give it that nice light. And in this case, I have achieved that. Whenever you look at that holographic tinsel on the back, it has that real nice gleam to it. Just enough to attract, hopefully a trout, maybe a few of us as well. Might clean this up. There's a little fiber jutting out of the dubbing right there. And now I have my finished two-bit hooker fly. This is just a really quick pattern to, to tie. I really took my time just kind of explaining all the procedures for this nymph, but please don't let this scare you. It's a really down and dirty fly that will get to the bottom quickly and catch lots of trout. Trust me on that. Now be careful because it will be on the bottom. You got those two beads. I mean, you have a great chance of losing these patterns. So make sure that you do have, if you're using an indicator, it placed in the, appro appro or the appropriate place so you're not losing a lot of these flies. It can be really frustrating going out there, tying up a bunch of new flies and losing half of them on the body. In fact, today I was out fishing and I lost almost 10 to 12 flies. It's definitely a pain in the butt. But as long as you're catching fish during the process, that is a good thing. So once again, this is uh, Charlie Craven's 2-Bit Hooker. Thanks go out to Allen Fly Fishing for the use of their W501BL Nymph and Wet Fly Hook. You can check those out at allenflyfishing.com. And also thanks to Una Products for the use of their ADOT threads. Just wonderful threads that I recommend to all fly tires. Thanks as always go out to all of you guys for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them directly on this YouTube page. Or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for watching this YouTube fly tying tutorial.